thank you very much, everyone, for coming to our uh, weekly innovative discovery series. We are very excited today to have uh, Dr. Rebecca Pearl from the Center for Weight and Eating Disorders at University of Pennsylvania to give us a talk on weight stigma. But before I introduce her, let me mention some housekeeping issues. Uh, for CME credit, you must sign in and you must include your email and credentials. Do not miss our September 6 Tech Talk. I know it's kind of far away. Uh, also, please note that our next Innovative Discovery Series on May 18th, we will have also uh, another guest from University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Ronnie Drapkin, who is going to talk to us about zeroing in on ovarian cancer. Please register to help us prepare. And as always, the full schedule is posted on our website, dectr.org. So Dr. Pearl is Assistant Professor of Psychology in Psychiatry and in Surgery at the Perelman School of Medicine at University of Pennsylvania. She has a Master and PhD in Clinical Psychology from Yale and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at University of Pennsylvania Center for Weight and Eating Disorders. She already has a long list of peer-reviewed publications and has been invited to speak all over the country. She also just obtained a K23 award for five years, so it's an, a, a really prestigious NIH uh, grant to study how to improve long-term weight loss by reducing weight stigma. So thank you very much and welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here and it's been great so far to meet some folks and hear about the Values Institute. Uh, so I'll be talking today about weight stigma and health and um, specifically how this applies to medical and clinical care. Um, these are my disclosures. So I'm going to try to give you a very broad overview of what is weight bias and stigma um, and what are the known health consequences associated with this, uh, how this plays out in healthcare settings, and then hopefully leave you with some really concrete take-home strategies for how to reduce or prevent weight bias and stigma in your practice. Um, so to start off with some definitions, weight bias refers to negative attitudes toward individuals who are perceived to have excess weight. And these attitudes are based in some common stereotypes, like that people with obesity are lazy or lack willpower, are incompetent. Um, and there's a lot of blame that's placed on people because of their weight. So you often hear this phrase, personal responsibility, that's used a lot when discussing weight with this idea that uh, someone who can't control their weight is failing in this uh, sense of personal control and responsibility. And so because of this blame and these negative attitudes, people with obesity are often devalued in our society and ostracized. And so that's really what we're talking about when we talk about stigma. Um, just to spend a moment on this blame and, and personal responsibility piece, this is the most common uh, perceived cause of obesity among people with and without obesity. So even people with obesity tend to endorse causes like laziness and lack of willpower. Um, and the way that weight is talked about, it usually focuses on the individual uh, internal sense of control rather than external factors. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, people who believe that weight really is an issue of internal control and personal responsibility tend to have more negative attitudes toward people with obesity and are also less likely to support public policy initiatives that are aimed at preventing and reducing obesity. Um, I'm not going to give a talk about the ideology of obesity to kind of challenge this idea. So this is just a graphic that um, describes a lot of the different causes of obesity. So you can't read anything, uh, but it basically summarizes the economic factors involved, the psychological factors, the biological factors, which does play a big part. Um, so really, this is just meant to emphasize that obesity is a really complex disease, and there are so many contributing factors that to reduce it to just an issue of control and responsibility is a, a really large oversimplification of the issue. So I'll, I'll describe different ways in which stigma may occur, and it can occur at different levels. So at the structural level or the institutional or societal level, we have things um, like policies that are in place that promote or don't prevent stigmatization. Um, at the interpersonal level, we have the person-to-person -person interactions like discrimination or teasing or bullying. 
And then at the intrapersonal level, this is uh, internalized stigma or self-directed stigma. So I'll talk about uh, media exposure as an example of structural or societal weight bias, um, and then some experiences of weight bias and internalization of weight bias. So to start with the media examples, uh, you've all seen these kinds of images in the media, probably whenever there's a story about weight or obesity, you see these very stereotypical pictures of people eating unhealthy foods or being sedentary. Um, you often see these unflattering close-ups of body parts with the heads cut off in this very dehumanizing way when obesity is portrayed. Um, in popular television shows and movies, the overweight characters are often the butt of the joke. They're portrayed as incompetent or slow or undesirable. Um, and in recent years, social media has really, you know, opened up this whole new avenue for weight stigma where you see all these memes and, and comments um, where weight is portrayed in this very blaming, shaming manner. Um, I've learned to never read the comments section on any article about obesity because the kinds of things that people say on these, uh, I mean, perhaps not surprisingly in all contexts, but uh, there's just a lot of really blatant blaming and shaming that goes on on the internet. Um, we also see weight stigma in public health campaigns, um, which may be unintentional, but here are some examples. So this was from several years ago, a campaign in Atlanta um, that had warning labels with pictures of kids with obesity saying things like stocky, chubby, chunky are still fat. Um, so there were no recommendations for what to do about it. It was just literally labeling kids with a warning sign. Um, and this campaign did get some criticism and the people who created the campaign stood by it and said, no, we need to do something to shock people into realizing what a problem this is. Um, so we'll talk about whether or not that's an effective strategy. Uh, this was an exhibit at Disney on childhood obesity that had characters like the glutton and lead bottom. Um, and luckily this uh, exhibit was shut down because of public outrage and especially because uh, bullying is such a huge problem for overweight youth. But even just recently, I snapped this picture of an advertisement for this new uh, Snow White animated movie where it says, what if Snow White was no longer beautiful and it has a picture of Snow White as overweight, right? So what kind of message is that sending our kids about what's beauty, what is, what is positive or negative? Um, so you might ask, okay, well, this is in the media, but so what? Um, so my colleagues and I did some studies about the effects of these images on public attitudes. So we had a, a experimental paradigm online where participants were randomly assigned to either see a stereotypical image or a non-stereotypical or, or even counter-stereotypical image. And we varied the race and gender of the person in the image. And then we measured a desire for social distance or avoidance, which is a common measure of stigma, as well as their just general attitudes toward the people in the picture. Um, and we also asked them how much they liked the image, how much they would want to see that image in the media. So participants either saw an image like this where, you know, kind of very much like the kinds that we typically see in the media, or they saw an image like this that was a counter stereotypical image. Um, and what we found across two different studies uh, and didn't matter uh, based on the race or gender of the person in the photo is that people who saw the images on the right expressed more positive attitudes toward the people in the images, less desire for social distance. And participants actually rated the images on the right as higher in terms of how much they liked them and wanted to see them in the media. Uh, we did a follow-up study to see how this might affect the way that news is consumed and specifically in the context of medical policy. Um, so in Canada, several years ago, there was a real proposal to deny women with obesity fertility treatments. And the rationale was that there are increased risks associated with higher body weight, um, but they had a set BMI cutoff. And so it was uh, criticized as being discriminatory and not really you know, taking the whole person into account, just having this BMI cutoff. So we did a study in the US where we had online participants read a news article about this proposal, and we presented it as a balanced argument of both describing the health risks and also the potentially discriminatory nature of it. Um, and the only difference between the conditions 
was the image that we paired with the article. So people either saw the stigmatizing image, the non-stigmatizing image, or no image at all. And then we measured how much people supported the policy and would want to recommend the policy in the US. So these are the mock-ups of the articles. So this is the positive image versus the stigmatizing image. Um, and I think you might know where I'm going with this, that the positive image did elicit less support for the discriminatory policy and they were less likely to recommend this policy in comparison to, to no image at all or the stigmatizing image. So I think this really highlights the power that these images can have to not only shape general attitudes, but actually you know, support for real life medical policies. Um, so moving down to the interpersonal level, weight bias experiences might include discrimination, um, teasing and bullying among youth, weight is the number one reason for bullying in the US. Usually sexual orientation is right there up with it. Um, things like social rejection or avoidance, um, comments from strangers on the street, which happens more than you might expect. Um, and this does occur across a lot of different domains in people's lives. Uh, I'll just note about weight discrimination because this is something I found fascinating is that weight discrimination is largely legal in the US and abroad. So there's one state, Michigan, in which it's illegal and a handful of cities and municipalities. Um, but by and large, it is completely legal to blatantly say that you're not hiring someone or uh, not promoting someone because of their weight. Um, and some of the proposals that have been in the works to try to uh, make this illegal are a combination of adding weight into civil rights kinds of laws, so the way that age was added as a protected characteristic, um, or included in disability laws. So severe obesity is included in some disability laws, although it, it still is tricky to use that as, as a, a legal route. Mm -hmm. Give us an example. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a really good question. Um, so I had a patient who was in the military and uh, couldn't rise up in the military and was actually forced out. Um, he was a dental hygienist at a Navy base and was pushed out because of his weight. Um, I, you hear this in sales too sometimes where people want to move into sales and they're told that they wouldn't be a good fit and then they look around at who are the people in sales and they tend to be thinner. So um, I, there's not a lot of like legal cases on the record because again, it's, it's not you know, something that's easy to fight, but I think this does come up in a lot of context. Um, and some people think that as obesity rates have risen, that weight discrimination has lessened, that people are more accepting of, of higher weights. And, I think there might be in, in a, the past couple of years maybe some evidence of that, um, but by and large, as obesity rates increase, so do rates of obesity-based discrimination. Um, so these are data from uh, a large-scale nationally representative sample from the late 90s to the early 2000s, looking at changes in lots of different kinds of discrimination. And BMI-based discrimination during this time increased by 66%. Um, and that was during a time when obesity rates were rising. So it may just be that there are more people with obesity who are now experiencing discrimination. Um, and if you break it down by gender, women are in the gray bars. Weight-based discrimination is as prevalent as race and age-based discrimination among women. So this is a really pervasive form of bias and discrimination. I'll give you some real world examples just to drive the point home. Um, this was a tweet from a psychology professor not too long ago saying, dear obese PhD applicants, if you didn't have the willpower to stop eating carbs, you won't have the willpower to do a dissertation. Um, and so again, it's, it's a really blatant form of discrimination and you can imagine inserting like a different kind of, of stigmatized group or minority group in here and the kind of reaction that that would elicit. Um, this was an example recently of a woman who wouldn't send her child to a uh, kindergarten or preschool because the teacher was overweight and she was afraid she would be an unhealthy role model for her child. Um, this was a Texas hospital a few years back that blatantly said it wouldn't hire employees in the hospital with obesity. Um, and the reason that they give here at the bottom is that every employee should fit with a representational image or specific mental projection of the job of a healthcare professional. 
So if you don't look like a health professional, whatever that means, then you're not going to be hired. Um, this, this is a different kind of, of weight discrimination. Uh, so the NHS in the UK uh, just this past year announced that for specific kinds of surgeries, like you know, elective or non-urgent surgeries, people with obesity would have to lose weight before being eligible for surgery. Um, and they have different weight criteria depending on a person's weight or BMI of how much weight they would be required to lose. Um, and this also included bariatric surgery, which in the US too, there are often requirements around having to lose weight, even though the person is there because they're struggling to lose weight. Um, so, you know, there's different reasons why this was proposed, um, but at the end of the day, it is sending this message that if someone has obesity, they don't deserve to have the surgery as much as everyone else until they prove that they can lose weight. And the last form of stigma I'll just talk about briefly is internalized stigma or self-directed stigma. So this occurs when people with obesity are aware of these negative stereotypes, uh, they believe that they're true of them, and so they're devaluing themselves or um, lowering their own self-worth specifically because of their weight. Um, so to demonstrate this, I just want to show a brief clip from the documentary series from HBO, Weight of the Nation. Um, so this is a great documentary series, and they had, in addition to the main series, some 15-minute shorts that are available online. Uh, so I'll just play this clip that, oops, maybe, uh, that I think demonstrates this issue of internalized weight bias. I feel invisible. I feel like I'm something that just shouldn't be there something that they don't want to look at they don't want to be around sometimes i wish i was invisible and that's why i would always buy clothes that would cover me up because i didn't want anybody to really see who i was i wish i could cover my face because i didn't want to face society i instantly look at someone and, and start doing their dialogue in their in my head you know no matter how many friends i had or how good I was at what I was doing or how successful I was. I always felt that I wasn't successful enough or had enough friends or people really liked me because I was overweight. I learned early on that what you look like is gonna hurt people. So don't go out and let them see you. I hated myself more than people hated me. So I will just note that not everyone with obesity has this weight bias internalization, but it certainly does affect a significant minority of people. All right, so I'm going to turn to the health consequences. Um, and so stigma broadly, like across other kinds of stigma, has been recognized as a form of chronic stress. So this has been tackled with mental illness, uh, with drug addiction, even with cancer not too long ago was stigmatized. Um, and yet with obesity, there seems to be this different kind of uh, perception that persists that maybe a little bit of stigma might be helpful or might motivate people to lose weight. And, and if people feel too good about themselves, then they're not going to make any health behavior changes. Um, so if you take anything away from this talk, it is that that is not true. And over and over again, we just find the opposite effect from studies. So I'm going to walk through this diagram that just summarizes. Uh, a pretty large body of research at this point on how weight discrimination affects health. Um, so when someone is under stress uh, caused by discrimination, they often eat as a way of coping. So they're eating more food or they're more likely to binge eat. Um, people who are worried about what others are thinking about them at the gym or what others might say to them are also less likely to exercise or especially exercise in public. There's also a physiological stress response uh, that follows weight discrimination, and this has been shown in experimental studies as well as longitudinal observational studies where you see things like changes in cortisol, markers of inflammation, A1C, blood pressure. So there's a real physiological reactivity when people are in these stressful situations. And then in turn, those can interact with eating behaviors, for example, increasing appetite, which then leads to, to greater food consumption. So overall, there's evidence that weight discrimination leads to more weight gain over time. It doesn't help people lose weight. It leads to more weight gain. Um, there are also an array of psychological consequences like depression and anxiety. Um, in healthcare, this can affect the patient-physician interaction. Um, so there's a lot of evidence that patients tend to avoid 
seeking health care, if they feel judged by their provider, um, they're less likely to follow physician recommendations uh, or return for treatment. And it can also uh, affect the communication with the provider. It can also affect the provider's behavior in terms of ordering more tests or less tests or spending less time with patients. So overall, the, the research really strongly shows that weight stigma and discrimination leads to worse health-related quality of life, worse management of health issues. And I should also note that all of these studies usually control for BMI or health issues, so it's, it's not the obesity that's causing these problems, it's above and beyond the BMI that you're seeing these kinds of effects of the stigma. Um, I'll also note that discrimination has some socioeconomic consequences, right? If, if someone is being discriminated against and not able to move up um, in wages or not being hired, um, there is evidence, especially among girls, of weight discrimination in education and not being less likely to achieve higher education, again, controlling for other kinds of health or socioeconomic factors. And then, you know, socioeconomic factors then influence health as well. So it becomes this cycle. Just to give you some more specific research studies. Um, so there was a, a large scale nationally representative sample that looked at mental health among people who reported discrimination versus those who did not. And again, controlling for BMI and other sociodemographics, people who reported weight discrimination or half of people who reported weight discrimination had a mood anxiety or substance use disorder, and they were two and a half times more likely than those who didn't to have at least three comorbid psychiatric disorders. Um, in kids, weight teasing is associated with suicidal ideation and behaviors, and again, given the prevalence of overweight and obesity in kids and the fact that this is a leading reason for bullying and teasing, you can imagine kind of the, the public health impact of that. As far as physical health, um, so again, just to kind of uh, break down some of the findings, so there are studies that when people are put into paradigms where they're expecting to be rejected because of their weight, you see differences in cortisol. Um, They've looked at things like C-reactive protein and F2 isoprostanes among people who have uh, chronic weight discrimination, um, as well as, as I mentioned, looking at weight gain over time. This has been shown in multiple studies of really large-scale observational studies. Um, in some studies, weight discrimination predicts worse weight loss outcomes, although the findings on this are a little mixed. So this is an area where more research is needed to really understand the effects of stigma on weight loss outcomes. Um, and then there was one study that, again, in two separate big samples, actually found increased mortality risk among people who had reported weight discrimination, again, controlling for all these other relevant factors. So this is definitely an area where more work is needed to understand, like, what are the mechanisms behind this? But all in all, it seems pretty fair at this point to conclude that weight stigma is bad for health. Um, in the media, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we see a lot of this stigmatizing content. So this is reaching people on a, a really broad scale. Um, and there have been studies showing things like increased caloric consumption, um, changes in cortisol reactivity, um, as well as reduced intentions to engage in, in health behaviors. Um, so just as an example, this was a, a randomized uh, study where people were seeing different kinds of media campaigns. And these are the kinds of campaigns, the stigmatizing campaigns, that were rate, rated as the least motivating, whereas the more neutral or positive campaigns that maybe didn't even mention weight at all were reported to be the most positive and the most motivating that people said that were more likely to comply with the improved health behaviors. Um, weight bias internalization is also associated with a lot of poor psychological outcomes. Um, there's less research on the physical health outcomes of weight bias internalization. Um, that's something I've been particularly interested in. So we did a study at Penn of uh, adults who were seeking weight loss treatment at baseline and looked at the prevalence of metabolic syndrome in this population. And again, controlling for BMI, depression, other kinds of sociodemographics, we found that people who had high levels of weight bias internalization had three times greater odds of having metabolic syndrome than those who didn't. So this is among people with obesity. Um, and specifically, when you looked at the different criteria, they had six times greater odds of having high triglycerides. 
So more work is needed to really understand this pathway. Is it a, a physiological stress pathway? Is it more behavioral? Um, but certainly there's something going on with these both. All right, so what does this look like in, in healthcare settings? Um, so I'll, I'll say at the, at the front that there have been studies across like every kind of healthcare professional you can think of, and these weight-biased attitudes have been documented across the board, even in people who specialize in obesity. So no one is immune to having biases, that's part of being human. Um, so the key is really just to have this awareness and, and to do something about it so it's not affecting patient care. Um, so just as some examples, there was uh, a study of about 50 medical schools looking at these attitudes in medical students and finding both explicit and implicit or unconscious bias against people, patients with obesity in medical students. And these attitudes were more negative than toward people of other kinds of stigmatized groups, like based on race or sexual orientation. Um, this same kind of study was also done in physicians, showing basically the same findings. So it's clear that this bias starts early in the medical training, or is at least present early, and continues throughout. Um, there was also a study done at the Obesity Society annual meeting. So this is researchers and clinicians who specialize in the field, um, showing an increase in explicit prejudice over the course of a, a little over a decade. So this is particularly concerning given that these are folks who are working with these patients or, or specializing in this area. Um, studies of patients have asked them uh, about their healthcare experiences. And um, in this one study of 2,500 women, almost 70% reported feeling stigmatized by a doctor because of their weight. Um, and half said that this happened more than once. So this wasn't just an isolated incident. Um, now, it is true that doctors are maybe more likely to bring up weight than other people in their lives, and so there's more opportunities for feeling judged. Um, and I should also say that I don't think all doctors are intentionally doing this, that it might be more perceived on the part of the patient. Um, but what's clear is that patients are walking away feeling this way, and so it's an important issue to address. Um, here are some quotes from a, a qualitative study asking people about just across the board their worst experiences of weight stigma. Uh, so this person said, I think the worst was my family doctor who made a habit of shrugging off my health concerns. The last time I went to him with a problem, he said, you just need to learn to push yourself away from the table. It later turned out that not only was I going through menopause, but my thyroid was barely working. So here was a, a doctor kind of dismissing a person's health concerns and then missing other health concerns that were there. This person said, I asked a gynecologist for help with low libido. His response, lose weight so your husband is interested. That will solve your problem. So you can imagine the likelihood that this patient's going to return to this doctor or any doctor after an experience like this. Um, and just anecdotally, I was just screening a research participant who wasn't eligible because her uh, if anyone is familiar with the Beck depression inventory, her, sk her score was 39. She was so depressed, and I asked her if she'd ever thought about seeing a therapist, and she said she talked to her doctor, and her doctor said, oh, if you just lose some weight, you'll feel better, right? So it, this is something that goes on all the time. Um, again, just to you know, highlight that patients are articulating that they are avoiding care because of things like unwanted comments about their weight, even when they come in for something completely unrelated, um, embarrassment of being weighed or medical equipment that's too small. I've heard multiple accounts of patients who went to their doctor and the scale was not a high enough capacity and they had to go out back to the docks to be weighed on the freight scale. So again, in terms of human dignity and, and how humiliating of that experience might be uh, of, and how that affects their likelihood of continuing to seek health care services. Um, last year, there was an article in the New York Times that I thought was really interesting. So it was geared toward patients with obesity, advising them on how do you talk with your doctor so that you're going to try to prevent them from attributing everything to your weight, and how do you, you know, be assertive and make it clear that it's not your weight. Um, but I think that's a good segue into talking about how we as healthcare professionals can also do our part to try to prevent people from feeling judged or stigmatized when they're in a healthcare setting. 
Um, and I'll say that uh, a lot of this information is drawn from two great resources. Uh, one is from the Yukon Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity. They have a great website about weight stigma that also has a section specifically for healthcare professionals. Um, and the other is the Stop Obesity Alliance. They have a great uh, set of materials as well. So the, the first thing that I recommend is to challenge any assumptions that you might be making coming into the room with a patient with obesity. Um, because for one thing, weight alone really doesn't give you that in much information about a person's behaviors or their health. Um, you also don't want to assume that the person isn't motivated. And I do know that it can be frustrating when you're working with a patient and you're trying to help them lose weight and it just doesn't seem like they're doing anything, they're not making any progress. It can feel very um, frustrating and you can feel very helpless. And so it's natural to say, well, they're just not trying, they're just not motivated. And it kind of relieves us of any responsibility. Um, but first of all, you, you really never know what's going on for a person. And so I think a more helpful question to ask is, well, what's getting in the way? And then that puts you into a problem solving framework where you can work with the person to figure out, is it that they, they just don't think they can do it and they need some encouragement? Is it that they don't know the first step to take? Um, but to never just assume that because they're not losing weight, they're not trying hard enough. Um, and again, you know, it's weight can be related to a lot of health problems, but it's not always related to every health problem. So making sure that you're exploring other uh, reasons why someone is coming in with a complaint rather than just attributing it to weight. So in, in starting the conversation about weight, um, asking questions can be really helpful. So just the simple question of, is it okay if we talk about your weight today, just conveys respect and gives the person autonomy um, you can bring up their objective symptoms, like I've noticed your weight has increased by X amount, your blood sugars are X amount higher, and ask if, if they had noticed that, if they had any thoughts on why that, that might be. So being curious rather than lecturing them, um, and using open-ended questions like what are your eating habits like, what do you do for activity, rather than more pointed questions that can feel accusatory, like are you eating a lot of junk food? Are you doing anything for exercise that can make a person kind of feel like they're in the hot seat and that you're assuming that they're not doing anything? Um, if anyone's uh, familiar with motivational interviewing techniques, these can be helpful for opening up the conversation about weight. So this is a technique that really tries to uh, draw out the internal motivation from the patient rather than putting your own motivation onto the patient, so asking them how ready they feel to make their changes, how confident they feel, seeing what you can do to get them to feel more confident. Um, focusing on behaviors rather than weight itself, so someone can't like snap their fingers and decide that they're going to be five pounds lighter. They have to do things, do behaviors, eat differently, exercise more in order to make that change, but it's not always a one-to-one -one change. So. If someone's only focused on the number on their scale and they're doing everything right and there's a week or two where the scale doesn't move, it makes it more likely that they're gonna give up or get frustrated rather if, than if they're focused on all the successes they're having, they're having in changing their health behaviors. Um, and along those lines, focusing on health rather than appearance. Um, so patients might bring up their appearance and that's fine, but we're healthcare professionals, so we're really focused on the health benefits um, feeling better rather than looking different. So once you have your foot in the door, you've started this conversation, um, you can continue to provide information, again, based on the person's complaints and their objective information. So always tying it back to what is the patient motivated to achieve? What are they here for? What are they looking for? What are they concerned about? Um, I, I have done like bariatric surgery evaluations and I think the number one reason why patients have told me they want to lose weight is so they can run around with their kids or their grandkids, right? So always tying it back to their motivation, their concerns. Um, it's okay to offer clear and direct advice. So sometimes this can swing in the other direction where providers are afraid to talk about weight because they don't want to offend someone. But 
you are the health expert in the room, so it's okay to, to give your advice and to give your suggestions, um, but you can give options to the patient. So you can ask them, what would make sense for them? Is it focusing on reducing their soda intake or getting more steps every day? So giving them different options of what might help them. Um, it never hurts to just take an extra moment to give some encouragement or validate how difficult it can be to change health behaviors or to lose weight, um, especially if you consider that they might be anxious about seeing a health professional if they've been uh, judged or stigmatized in the past. So it doesn't hurt to really kind of be the person's cheerleader and coach and, and give that positive feedback to them or that positive energy to them. Um, while also managing their expectations. So if someone comes in saying they want to get down to their high school weight, you know, you want to help them set uh, realistic expectations, set really achievable goals, again, so that they're not going to become demoralized and give up, um, which especially might be uh, relevant for folks who have internalized stigma. If they already feel like they can't do it and they're lazy, if they don't have a really uh, achievable goal to help them propel forward, they're more likely to give up. Um, being careful about the language that we use uh, is important. So there's been an initiative from the Obesity Society as well as um, other obesity and weight related organizations to use people first language. Um, and this is used with other kinds of stigmatized groups as well. So a person with obesity rather than like the obese, which kind of groups people together, they lose their individuality. Um, and when talking about weight, you can also ask the patient what terms they prefer to use when talking about weight. There have been a bunch of studies about generally what people prefer or don't prefer. So these are the kinds of terms that patients typically don't like, like morbid obesity, um, fat, heavy, diet. Those are, are tend to be kind of red alert words, whereas more neutral words like BMI, healthy weight, activity, eating habits uh, tend to go over better with patients. If anyone works with children, um, parents get a lot of blame for their children's weight and it can uh, really kind of translate the stigma to them. So I don't know if anyone remembers this ad uh, from a few years ago, but it basically was equating uh, giving a kid a Big Mac to injecting them with heroin. Um, so you know, this is the kind of blame that people put on, on parents of like, why aren't you controlling your kid's weight or why aren't you controlling what they're eating? So I think it's important to acknowledge that it's really difficult for parents to control what their kids are eating, especially in the school environment or in the local corner stores around schools. Like there's so much access to this food. Um, and so when working with kids and their families, it's helpful to make it a family activity. And so it, it, it's about improving everybody's health behaviors and health habits in the family, especially if there's only one kid who's overweight, you don't want that kid singled out as like, you know, that kid's not allowed to have dessert, but the other siblings are. So making sure it's applicable to everyone and making it a fun family activity. Um, the office environment can also be set up in a way where it's more uh, accepting or respectful of people who have larger sizes. So, um, so for one thing, if you can weigh someone in private, like I know sometimes clinic structures are, are tricky, but if you can have a private area for weighing, that's really ideal. Um, you know, we don't go into the lobby and yell out people's like blood pressure results or other test results. So we really don't want to be in a setting where people are feeling self-conscious about their weight. Um, again, you can ask permission to weigh someone. If they say no, that's a really important conversation to have of like, well, why is it that you're so, you know, anxious or upset about being weighed? Um, if they don't want to see the number, that's fine too. They can face away. Like you can still have a discussion about weight without giving them a specific number. Um, and it, when you are writing down their weight or recording it, you know, try to, I know sometimes it can be uncomfortable. You feel like you need to say something, but just like be objective about it. It's just an, you know, objective test like anything else. You don't need to comment about their weight. Um, having the proper sized equipment is really key. So gown sizes, scales, of course. Um, you can have wide base chairs or chairs without arms. Um, even in the, the waiting area, making sure furniture is arranged in a way where people can move between the tables and chairs comfortably. 
Um, being aware of the visual uh, portrayals that you have. So if it's in a clinical setting, you know, kind of thinking about what magazines you have. Do you really need to have like top 10 beach bods or something on a table? Like thinking about appropriate materials or posters that you have around, making sure they're not stigmatizing um, in research presentations, you know, thinking about the kinds of images you're using. If you're talking about obesity, you can always use other kinds of images like of food or restaurants rather than of people in order to avoid any kind of uh, stigmatizing content. There are also some great resources for images if you are, if any of you are in a, a setting where these images are relevant. So the Red Center and the OAC, the Obesity Action Coalition, have free databases of these kinds of professional photos. They also have B-reels and, and video footage. So these are great uh, resources if you need to use some kind of positive images. And I have seen these images used in like news stories and things like that. So it's a really great resource. Um, as far as internalized stigma, you know, in your practice, you can be on the lookout for it if a patient is like really beating themselves up for their weight or saying they're just so lazy. Uh, you know, you can, again, give some encouragement, explain that there's a lot of factors that relate to obesity or cause obesity, like biology and the environment. Um, and if you are concerned about depression, then certainly you can refer them for proper treatment. So you don't want to assume everyone with obesity is depressed, but if you see it and it seems to really be, um, you know, causing suffering in the person, even if it is weight related, it would still be appropriate to get psychological treatment. So to summarize the main points, uh, weight bias and discrimination are very pervasive in our society, uh, and there are negative health consequences to this experience of weight discrimination above and beyond the effects of obesity on health. Um, and so we as healthcare professionals, uh, as wanting to provide a setting of improving health and, and improving care of our patients, we can do our best to manage our biases and set up things in a way that's going to help people feel respected and supported in their health care. Um, just as people in your, in your daily life, you know, if someone makes a fat joke, you don't have to laugh. You, as a healthcare professional, you can educate other people who might not have as much knowledge of the complexity of obesity. Um, and it's also, I think, helpful to think outside of our own experiences, because everybody eats, everybody has a weight. And sometimes we tend to make assumptions about what someone's weight loss should be or what they should be able to do based on our experience. Um, but it is really important to consider all of these factors that might be working against someone with their weight management that we might not personally share. And so to not make assumptions or judgments about another person's weight or weight management based on just what you alone have experienced. Um, there is a, an IAT or an implicit associations test online if anyone is interested in just kind of engaging with this more. So this is a psychological test um, that's free. It takes like five minutes. You press a bunch of keys and it measures your implicit bias. And they have this for all sorts of stigmatized groups, but they have one for weight as well. Um, so I think it can be a, a nice way or for students to pass it along to um, a nice way to just kind of take a moment and reflect on your own biases. Um, so thank you so much for, for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Have you done any studies at how someone her or their the healthcare field? Yeah. It's a great question. So um, there aren't any studies that I know of about like cultural beliefs. Um, we did a study at Penn of medical students and internal medicine residents and just asked them about their own weight loss history. 
Um, so those, and so for folks in that like sample who had lost weight, we're talking like five to 10 pounds probably, um, but those who had lost weight and maintained it had more negative attitudes toward patients who couldn't successfully lose weight and had less compassion for them. And so, you know, the theory is that it's like, if I could do it, you could do it and not having as much compassion for it. Um, but of course, like Penn medical students are very different from the, you know, patients in the greater Philadelphia area that we serve. So, um, I think there, you know, there, there is some evidence that this happens. So, but I think definitely like thinking more about how do we teach people to think outside their own experience. I know um, there has been some work on like using standardized patients that have like non stereotypical portrayals of people with obesity in order to really kind of emphasize, you know, the issues that are facing patients that it's not just that they're lazy and aren't exercising that like they live in a food desert or all these other kinds of things that affect it. But yeah, and, and again, you know, health professionals are just people. So of course, it's natural to draw, you know, draw information based on our own experience. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Question. One, beginning Mm -hmm. um, and then it strikes me in Philadelphia in the last few years did an experiment with sugar tax um, and saw that push back. Of course, there are corporate interests. But can you say more about um, <clears throat> research where you think about interventions about changing sort of collective attitudes? So, towards policies? Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And, and I am also all for top down change. Um, I think in terms of interventions at the individual level, and to some extent, like you already have people with obesity, so prevention efforts aren't gonna address their issues. Um, so I think uh, one strategy in terms of public attitudes for weight stigma, I think the media could play a big role. And, and I have seen more stories kind of highlighting this issue about body shaming or fat shaming, just to kind of raise more awareness of it. Um, although, unfortunately, sometimes in the same publications, the next day you have an article of like, does she look fat? So, you know, it's one step at a time. Um, but I think, you know, more representation in like movies or television shows where the overweight character is just portrayed as like a normal person and who has a job and a family rather than like they're the one who's always eating, like those kinds of things I think can play a role. Um, I, I'm very interested in like legislation to prohibit weight discrimination. So I've been recently talking with someone in, in the Philadelphia um, Center for Public Health to see if someone might be interested in like taking on this issue since the soda tax was like such a, a bold move. Um, so I think that just like legislation also sends a message to people that this is not okay. So whether or not legally in specific cases it pans out, like it does at least delegitimize discrimination. And so it tells the public and also people with obesity that like, it's not okay to treat people like this. It's not acceptable. Um, and I think within, in terms of in the healthcare system, like a broad impact, I think is just more training and even just obesity education because med school curriculums are so jammed packed with so much information that there's not a lot of time spent on obesity um, and considering the proportion of our patients that have this issue. I think also just, you know, non-stereotypical case presentations could potentially have a, a and, and in a standardized way could potentially reduce bias. Um, I, I was really surprised that you talked about the, the fact that you said the stigmatization among the healthcare professionals to go to this uh, obesity meeting was increasing in the last mm -hmm. 20 years, had, had increased in the last mm -hmm. 20 years. So why do you think it's the case? I, I don't know. Um, so, so I will say, so explicit attitudes increased, but implicit attitudes decreased. So I'm not sure what that <laughs> is about. Um, I mean, I, I can attest, I was there two, when I was there two years ago, um, Vox picked up this story where there was a, a physician who was attending the meeting who sent out this like tweet and it had pictures of two of the keynote speakers, one of which was my former advisor, Kelly Brownell, who's 
who has obesity and the other uh, speaker too had obesity. And he sent out this tweet saying like, these are the experts in the field. Um, and it got like a lot of kind of outrage, but, but here was a person who's a physician who specializes in obesity, making fun of these like renowned experts in our field because of their weight. So, uh, it's, it's real. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's frustration. Uh, yeah, it could be, maybe that's true. That's a good point. That's, that is one thing that's changed a lot. So it could be social media or or I don't know, or frustration that people get when they've been working in the field for a while. I, I don't know, I think it's a good question. Yeah. Question. I think you had part of the wider uh, thinking about mm. and one of the impressions that in a pediatric regarding advising parents about or disease appropriate, whatever the condition is based on, that they did a reasonably good job, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with newborn, et cetera, and all get into the teenager of uh, eating disorders mm -hmm. population. I'm not that category. Sure. And I'm wondering if those best practices can be uh, transferred to the adult cohort. Mm -hmm. Can the pediatric cohort maybe advise the adult providers on how to transmit this information? Mm -hmm. uh, am I off base here? No, so, so I have never worked in pediatrics, so I'm not sure what other, what kinds of systems are in place. I don't know if you can say a bit more about what are, like is there something in particular you think could be applied to adults? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say something very healthy based. Is it so sometimes we'll see them carry out um, but I watch how the nurses interact with the families feeding them. Mm -hmm. And they're, it, I got the impression they're giving good information, mm -hmm. and the parents are very receptive to it, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm wondering if they have figured out how to transmit these are the healthy choices. Yeah. The baby. Mm -hmm. uh, are there mechanisms that can be uh, uh, generalized to the adult, the way they're communicating? These yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a good uh, idea. So I think like if they have standardized protocols, then I think that certainly could be disseminated. Um, because I mean, most like there's so much variability in like internal medicine or family medicine, like there's no real go to, I mean, there, there are professional guidelines from like the NIH and things like that, but to have some kind of like checklist or, or something like that, that could be translated so that every person who comes in with a child who seems to be struggling with their weight gets the same kind of recommendations um, and then tailored from there. I think with, with obesity, the issue that comes in is this blame, right? So I think it's, it's different than some of the more like objective kinds of things like here's what you know a baby needs to thrive versus like uh with obesity it, it there are so many factors that could be influencing it so like telling a person from north philadelphia that they need to you know eat more quinoa is like not going to be a good recommendation um or not always a recommendation that they can follow if they don't have access to a store that even carries quinoa so um, I think it, it's just such a complex disease that it's it's hard to articulate like what's a, a you know one to two point plan that could address it. But I definitely think like conversation between peds and an adult is very helpful. And in Philly, luckily, CHOP is like right across the street from HUP, and so there is a lot of like grand rounds that are attended across the board. And in our center, uh, we have someone Bob Berkowitz who used to run the CHOP Center for Weight for Kids. So we do have some adolescent uh, interaction. But yeah, I think, because, and I think there's also more room for development with childhood obesity treatment. So I don't know if the PEDS people have figured it out for obesity either. Yeah. Yeah. So I am pediatrics. <laughs> um, and it, it's so hard for us. Um, you know, when in the baby phase, it's a lot of parent -led, right? And so I, 
We also um, rely heavily on growth charts, and that's something visual that a parent sees. So, you know, plotting at each visit, showing them what, you know, the growth, you know, looks like, what the BMI is, has a tendency to, you know, kind of play out. But as they start to transition to the toddler, if you do have parents who, you know, have an eating disorder themselves, it's often that you will find that child will start to mimic some of those behaviors. It really can be very cyclical. Um, and the other thing is for the lower socioeconomic, you know, whether it's an adult or whether it's a child, when they're getting assistance, your money goes a whole lot further mm -hmm. when you're buying, you know, the sack of rice or the sack of potatoes that is not always the most nutritious for yeah. those kids. So we still struggle a lot. We don't see it as much in the baby, you know, in the infancy, but once they hit that toddler, you start to see things change significantly. It's a struggle all the way around. One of the things on a, on a personal note, when I was bullied by a teacher, um, I used to pass some, I don't know, pass the, uh, in terms of my own. But the, um, I noticed my children when they were my age. Mm. And I picked up on it quick enough and stopped getting thrown at home. Mm. Now, the, the problem was I drank it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, the, but they didn't get the decline. Yeah. And so uh, as a result, all three of them exhibit very healthy behaviors towards uh, food and so forth. But I noticed it was when I made the connection that my children would not do what I say, but do what I do. Mm -hmm. That that's when I made my own modification, mm -hmm. and it did translate into some healthy behaviors that they now possess. Mm -hmm. In fact, they will not touch the stuff that I eat. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that can be a great motivation for adult patients of wanting to change their health behaviors so that their kids also learn these healthy habits. Yeah. So a couple of weeks ago. There was um, a symposium on lung cancer, and it was interesting because some of the same, so one of the speakers was talking about um, stigma among smokers and that they you know, don't eat certain behaviors. Mm -hmm. So I see, you know, similar connection to this. Mm -hmm. There was a campaign that showed that was trying to sort of address this. Are there similar campaigns to address this? Yeah. This issue of sort of not, you know, yeah, there's there's no like large scale like you know anti stigma campaign for weight that I'm aware of. There are a lot of groups that talk about body positivity, um, so it's often more kind of on the like eating disorder prevention side. But certainly there are lots of like body acceptance and body positivity movements and and groups that are doing that kind of advocacy work, which I think is has I think you know. Obesity and eating disorders, like weight stigma is a bridge between them. Um, and so I think any of those kinds of campaigns that have been out there have a positive effect of just adjusting everybody's ideas about what's, ex you know, accepting people of diverse sizes. Yeah. Um, and I, there's also a lot of, I think, like the research, um, you know, I was kind of trained in a lab that really was focused on doing good science, but then making sure it gets into the public sphere and translating it. And so I think there are some great researchers um, out there who are talking to legislators and, you know, testifying and trying to really get this out into the popular press too, to, you know, drive it home and, and provide some hard data to support this idea that this is something that needs to be addressed. Sorry. That I don't know. <laughs> that yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I, that is not a statistic I'm aware of. So people who usually seek weight loss treatment are more distressed than the general population. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't, I don't know the numbers on that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think like the WHO and the and the NIH guidelines, like those really do, I think, set the standards. And 
Um, and even the pediatrics just came out with new guidelines, which are fantastic, and they have a whole section on weight stigma in there. So I think the medical organizations are, you know, as much as they can, I think, enter, you know, in starting to incorporate this issue at the obesity society. There's a ton of stigma um, work that's presented at the conferences, and, and they're very receptive to it in the journal. So I, I think, like, the, the big organizations are... Um, in recent years, and I think that's a lot of that has to do with some of my like predecessors and mentors who spent a lot of time really like driving in the point about this issue. Um, and as far as obesity treatment broadly, um, I think there's still, you know, we still don't have good treatments for helping people keep the weight off long term. So that's an area where like NIH is very interested in just kind of more maintenance kinds of interventions. So I think you know, the WHO and other organizations have as much recommendations as they can offer based on what we know from science. Thank you.